Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny Castle and I'm the Gallery and Programs Director at the Rose Center for the Arts. Uh, today I am here with uh, Aaron Robertson Grant and Zach Long. These are the two artists that are in the Forsberg Art Gallery's current exhibition, Unpacking. And we're very lucky to have them both today to talk about their work. Hi, hi you guys. Hello. <laughs> um, uh, so um, assuming you haven't visited the show yet, we're going to give some examples of each of the artists work before we get started with the discussion. Um, so we'll start with Zach Long. Zach Long is a filmmaker in San Francisco, California. His work explores what it means to call something truth within a narrative. Long works as a senior multimedia producer for the University of California. And his films have been screened internationally. Most recently in conjunction with Vox, he produced several videos in the Climate Lab web series, including why your old phones collect in junk drawer of sadness and uh, the fight to rethink and reinvent nuclear power. So give me one moment, I'll share my screen and we'll take a look at an example of Zach's work. Can you guys see that okay? Mm -hmm. Yep, I see it. Okay, that was a short clip from one of the videos Zach currently has um, in the Forsberg Art Gallery. Zach, what's the title of that work? Uh, that is Barb and the Giant Rock. Okay, do you want to talk a little bit about that before we move on to Aaron? Yeah, I mean, that was a, a video I did at um, a UFO conference in the desert, and uh, it was kind of a, an excerpt of a little um, tour that they took that they kind of take people on out to this giant rock. Where there's UFO sightings. And so the video is kind of me um, and my experience kind of going out there and kind of, you know, just experiencing that and just kind of being outside of my comfort zone, definitely. <laughs> yeah, it's a great context for the video. Um, so Aaron is the second artist in this show um, that they, that they, um, collaborate, collaborated on that's currently in the gallery. Aaron Robertson Grant is a new media artist residing in Portland, Oregon. Originally from Indiana, Grant earned her BFA at the Cleveland Institute of Art and then her MFA at Indiana University. Her work deals with birth, death, um, and our object response to it. She explores these themes through a mat. I have not practiced this, Erin. <laughs> Say that <laughs> word for me. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> Amalgamation. Is that right? <laughs> Good heavens. Amalgamation <laughs> of video, animation, drawing, installation, performance, and computer interaction. So let's take a quick look at Aaron's work as well. Erin, do you want to make any comments about that clip? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, for this show, um, I made a couple new videos. Um, that one um, is titled uh, The Great Beyond. And um, really for this work, um, so I work um, in the dental field, actually, as um, a dental technician right now. Um, focusing mainly on, um, you know, removable prosthesis, more popularly known as dentures. Um, but, um, but over this past year, actually, I did spend some time um, working with an oral surgeon and working with the clinic. And um, I've always really had an interest um, in, you know, anatomy and the body within my practice. Um, but it definitely was a more intense experience um, when I actually was dealing, you know, 
forthrightly, you know, with, you know, people while they were being operated on and such. And it really kind of gave me a lot, a different perspective and a lot of different ideas about, you know, what the human body is capable of and what its limits are. Um, and so really, you know, with this newer work, I'm starting to explore that. And, um, you know, just, just thinking about, you know, what, you know, where the body starts and stops, you know, its limitations and so on. And the premise of the show, I mean, you, you both are coming from very different, um, well, you're, you're covering different subject matters and you're also approaching video art in very different ways. But the connection in the work is really like kind of pushing past points of comfort um, in, in like in life in general and, and, and our relationship with the world. So do you want to, do either of you want to talk a little bit more about that and what maybe inspired you to start working with that topic? Oh, you want to go for a sec? <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Like, you know, for my work, I felt like, you know, I was trying to think of like what like the overall theme was for what I was like immediately kind of interested in. And I was kind of thinking about how the written word or how things maybe online when they're brought to life or brought out into like the voice and spoken kind of take on a life of their own and kind of change. And so it's kind of like um, the way to unpack a lot of that kind of stuff. So that's kind of like where I was coming from. And there's sort of a discomfort in that. And especially with the um, with Barb and the Giant Rock because there's a lot of dialogue in there that I was kind of like recording there where, you know, this tour guide, this woman Barb, it's kind of talking about her day to day and that's stuff that I don't think she maybe was writing to, like typing out ever. It's just kind of talking about, yeah, you know, I, you know, I live here, I have this house, there's this really beautiful Joshua tree, you know, that kind of stuff. And then it would go into more of the UFO conspiracy stuff and it would just switch, like the feeling would change and it. And other folks in the car were the same way where they were, you know, part of these like maybe online forums where they're typing out stuff and a lot getting a lot of their conclusions just by typing out. And I think of a lot of that as like online communities. And then when it's spoken, you know, I thought there was an interesting moment in there where um, one of the people in the car was like, um, oh, I feel so comfortable just like saying all this stuff because probably in everyday life, they probably don't feel like they can do that. And so I feel like that there, that's like kind of one of the themes and same with, you know, my, my other work where, um, where with uh, the Palm Oasis and just not there yet, they're both kind of, taking on text and then having it spoken and kind of what does that mean and how does that change the dynamic? So Zach, you brought up a good point. When I played with those videos, no sound came through on them. And I'm not sure if that was a technical error on our end or if that's the way the clip was, was sent. Um, but you know, we think about visual art and what we see on the screen. Um, how important is sound to your work and um, like, yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? The dialogue seems really important. Yeah, um, I was, yeah, especially with these, with, with um, Just Not There Yet and the Palm Oasis, I was using uh, text-to-speech um, because I think um, it's kind of a thing that's become very common that I think you maybe see on TikTok where, you know, you might see on, on social media or on TikTok or Instagram Reels where someone's describing something that's like really inane or maybe something that's like upsetting or like a thing and it's that voice that's sort of this neutral slightly positive voice and it kind of alters the feeling or it feels like there's it takes out the feeling almost and then there's kind of this discomfort in that and so that's what I was trying to do especially with just not there yet those are like old like journal entries I wrote like when I first moved to San Francisco like 12 years ago and I don't even know what I was talking about in those when I read them now and so <clears throat> a lot of it for me the feeling has been removed from it just from that but I, I thought like taking it and having another voice reading it also kind of removes it and so I just think that's kind of an interesting thing there I also think the audio with um, uh, Barb and the Giant Rock um, a lot of it is just kind of that like um, run and gun documentary kind of style and so it's kind of like you might you're it's kind of experienced not as like a thing that's being spoken directly to you it's kind of a thing you're just around you and you're experiencing it kind of thing so yeah so Aaron I mean you approached your like 
the same theme in a very different way. Do you want to talk a little bit about well, that? It's it's interesting because I mean there is there is a very kind of gross literalness to the idea of unpacking with my work because it's literally like ah surgery like specifically you know being present for oral surgery you know in teeth you know um, so you know there there is that aspect but I think the other thing too about that is is that it's kind of coming to terms with like the literal like physicality of like a person and like what that means and how that forces all of us to confront, you know, things like mortality, you know, things, you know, like, you know, abjection where it's like, you know, what, you know, what do be what do these things that come out of me then become since they are no longer a part of me, you know, what does that mean, you know, and how does that affect how I think about myself. Um, so I think that's kind of how I approached sort of the theme of like unpacking and trying to kind of get your mind around these things because it's also I, I think also when we deal with kind of the corporality of the human body I think it's very easy to try to oversimplify it through sort of a scientific sort of idea where it's like oh yes you know this you know I you know know where my lungs are, I know where my stomach is, you know, here's my bones, here's that. Um, but there's a lot of like feeling and sort of psychology that surrounds it that kind of really surpasses words. Um, and I've always tried to really get to that idea, you know, with my or with, you know, video, not just video, but also, you know, other things that I do. But I think, um, you know, ha I think like, this project that I just made, um, I think I kind of get to like a greater sense of that. And I think it's something that, you know, when people are definitely confronted in say like a gallery setting, you know, with like a large, you know, especially it being displayed very large, um, I think people can like really feel that. And, you know, it's, it's that part of it that gets beyond just simply explaining something. Right, like you can watch a video that explains surgery, but then there's the emotional trauma associated with that type of experience, um, and then how you hold that physically beyond that experience. Yeah, I think your videos are touching on all of those things. <laughs> and then for, for those who haven't been in the gallery, Aaron also, I mean, in your videos, you're creating sculptures that you're then using in your video, but there's physically sculptures in the gallery as well. Yeah. So. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and why you wanted to pull the physicality off the screen and display that in the space? Yeah, you know, and and I think this also goes along with, you know, sort of the element of surprise that I do try to incorporate with my work. Because while I am making these things that are immediately viscerally kind of grotesque and disgusting, it's, it's ultimately all benign things that these things were made out of. So for instance, you know, the, you know, sculptures I have, you know, displayed in the gallery and also in my work, you know, they are made to look like basically festering wounds, more or less. Um, but really all they're made out of is plastic and jam and some fabric. Um, and I think when people learn that and when they actually like, are confronted with it more directly instead of seeing it at a remove it kind of you know it kind of adds a levity to it where it's like oh i can deal with this it's not literally something that you know could potentially harm me this is something that's very benign and so i think in that way it allows people because it, it creates more of like a sense of safety around it so while what I'm showing and displaying these themes can be, you know, really disconcerting, I think it allows people like, okay, this isn't, you know, real, real, you know, it allows people to kind of approach and engage with it and stay with the work longer. And any danger that they're feeling is coming from their imagination, right? Yeah, like, yeah. They're not, <laughs> they're not being confronted with actual blood or, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so the students have walked through the gallery. There's been some general questions about, you know, like you have an idea and how did you bring this together? And I mean, I know that's a really complicated answer. 
So I'd love to start with the collaboration portion. I mean, you, you, you all, you both have known each other for a long time and you decided to do a project together. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, on campus, we're, tr we're trying to build an artistic community, a creative community. And obviously the two of you are kind of part of each other's creative network, right? So how did this collaboration come about? And, um, do you, do you feel differently about projects that you work with with other artists versus solo? I mean, can you, can you talk a little bit about that and the experience? Yeah, I mean, I feel like, yeah, um, I, you know, I feel like with when Aaron and I kind of work together on something, you know, I think of like, uh, just thinking of the title and stuff like that, it's sort of like, we maybe start maybe not with one idea or maybe nothing at all. And then we kind of like realize like the connection like later on in the process. I think that's like probably the most interesting kind of aspect of us collaborating together. Yeah. What about you, Erin? Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because during the opening, you were kind of asking me about like, oh, how did you meet Zach? And how long have you known each other? And it was so funny because we've known each other for so long at this point. Yeah. I hadn't talked about it in a really long time. And I started to realize, oh, wow. Like I, I have known Zach for a very long time, you know, since, you know, undergrad. And yeah, we've worked together on different projects. We've exhibited together. And, you know, I, I think what's interesting is that, you know, from my perspective, I think we've always known, like, you know, we, we both have our own individual sensibilities, you know, with art making and different things that we're interested in. But I think part of it is we work so well together because I think there's, there's a lot of just like unspoken understanding yeah. about where we're going with what we're trying to do. Yeah. And I think, you know, what, I mean, even I was amazed. I mean, I, I know Zach's been, you know, working with these, you know, ideas and these videos for a very long time. And he kind of knew what I was working with. But when we finally showed each other the final projects, I just was like, oh my god you know like <laughs> even just you know kind of talking about these ideas and kind of sorting them through it's like you know we both kind of arrived at these you know kind of hefty you know things that we were trying to say and you know we created things that you know were really kind of unnerving you know in different ways but along the same like spectrum and I just you know I I know for me you know, I, I, and I told Zach this, you know, when I was putting the pieces together to bring over to install, I said, I'm just so proud of like what we've done together yeah, <laughs> and that like... we're having this show, <laughs> you know, um, but, um, but yeah. I think, I think what you said though, Aaron, like it's really important to like, if when you're working with someone that you don't, that they kind of get it right from the get go, yeah. like, a lot of stuff. And they, you know, that's the thing you like learn in the process. Like maybe you work I've, you know, I've worked with people where it's like, oh, they didn't quite get what I meant. And then it kind of, it's fine, but it's just sort of like, I don't really want to work maybe with this person, like in that way again, you know, just be friends. We're not like, you know, working on yeah. projects and, together or something, you know, like. I, and, and I won't <clears throat> lie, I think it is very hard to, you know, really find artists that, you know, you can work really well with um, just be, and, and maybe I just personally feel that way just because I feel like a big part of visual art is working beyond language. And so it's hard sometimes because like, you know, it all starts up here and sometimes, you know, it can't come out completely verbally yet. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I think like, you know, when you, when you do find like individuals, you know, and other artists that you can gel with, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's a good thing and it's something not to be taken for granted. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very vulnerable process as an individual and then to have to explain yourself to the person you're yeah. collaborating with constantly, <laughs> you know, would be would definitely be a challenge. Um, well, um, so you have the, you get these big ideas or even if it's a small idea that grows, right? Can you talk a little bit about your process um, specifically with video about like how you get content, how you organize that content, and then how do you, you know, actually release something into the world? Maybe talk a little bit about that process for people yeah. who are interested. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about that with, you know, with my work, like professionally, I do documentary work, or I do videos that are very planned out. And this is very different than that. Um, I think of 
you know, Barb and the Giant Rock. I, the premise of that was I was interested in going to this UFO conference in Joshua Tree in the desert because I was curious about possibly in the future doing a documentary about it. But um, I didn't end up doing that and that's fine. But what I ended up getting was I was kind of recording stuff for reference. And then, you know, I, I got to this conference. I was very uncomfortable um, because I didn't understand a lot of the conspiracy theories. I was definitely like, oh, I don't, I don't know what's going on. It was like that kind of feeling. And, you know, there was just kind of a moment where I saw like a lot of, you know, a lot, a lot of this conference was people who are on TV on like the history channel, like this concept of like ancient aliens and it's all these like people who are famous in this world. And I didn't know any of that, but what I was interested in is like sort of these like side people who are maybe locals who are trying to sell tours to like, let's go. So I, I saw these tours and there was this woman who was selling like $20 tickets to be driven out to the middle of nowhere with a group of people and they're going to show us UFOs. And I was like, I don't, I don't know where this is going to take me, but I will go on a tour with this lady. Her name is Barb. She was very friendly. She, she packed like bottled water and like snacks for us being out there. And I was going to go out for five hours to the middle of the desert at night with people I didn't know that were, were all very trusting. Conspiracy. <laughs> yeah. I still can't believe. When, like, but totally but that those crazy. clips are really just the car, the, the, what it felt like in the car ride out there, because I didn't have a car that really would be good on sand. <laughs> and, but a lot of people actually did. And there was like a caravan of people and she had a car that was good for that. And it was like me and two other people who just flew there and didn't really have cars. We didn't drive out to the desert. And so there's a woman from Minneapolis and a guy from England, and we were just these three strangers with her and that everyone felt a lot of camaraderie and I didn't feel that <laughs> at all. Um, so I was just, you know, recording that and I didn't really think much of that footage until I like, you know, maybe like a year later, I was like going through the footage for reference and stuff. And I was like, oh, this is actually really these, this conversation that I had in this like, you know, 20 minute car ride was really interesting. And so I thought, oh, maybe this could be like a, a piece that could kind of talk about this back and forth between what's real, what's not real. Like, like that's like kind of what was going through my head, especially in that moment. I like had no cell reception. I wanted to like Google everything and tell people like, this is not what I don't know what you're talking about. You know, it was a lot of that kind of like frustration. Um, so I think like, you know, that ended up being a piece I didn't expect. I didn't plan that out. I didn't say like, oh, I'm going to go on this tour and I'm going to like record this. You know, I didn't know. So I think like that can be um, kind of, that's generally my process when I do video art. And I feel like I like that. It's very different than my everyday work where I have to write a script and plan out things and, you know, get approval and show all these things to people. Um, it's a very different process. So I, I, I like it because it's freeing and it kind of, it lets you kind of, you know, let yourself like fail at a thing. Like you don't, you're like, oh yeah, that didn't work out. That's okay, whatever. I can do something else with this maybe, or maybe I don't use it at all or that kind of thing. So that's kind of, you know, the process of, to me for video art. And I don't think a lot of people um, know that or think about that because they think, you know, oh, you got to have all these people working on it. Like there's the director, there's the camera, you know, all that stuff. And it's, no, that's not really how I would say video art works. It kind of, it almost works like how, you know, if you're painting or drawing and you're like, oh, I'm erasing this or I'm painting over this and or I'm not going to use this painting or I'm going to do something different. Like it's still that process. Yeah. So Aaron, Zach comes at it, you know, from this documentary, aesthetic definitely but you know also kind of this like found imagery found um dialogue and he's in the world and you're more of like kind of a studio artist where you're creating you know you're like pulling down the paper and making making a world yeah. in front of the camera so your process is you know you're, you're both in this working with the same medium but your process is very different can you talk yeah. a little bit about and, that and you know it's it's interesting i i like what you said in the beginning where it starts as a small idea and then it grows because I think for me you know I you know as, as Zach mentioned you know even with his work you know as a video artist you know I, I don't start with a script I just I kind of have these visuals in my mind and I think okay like what you know why am I interested in this and you know where I'm going with this um and clearly, you know, even though I'm not starting with a strict script saying, first I'm going to, you know, show these teeth and then I'm going to show some muscles or anything. Um, you know, I do a lot of 
you know, video in my studio, you know, with performing. Um, I've done performance art in the past. And so that's a big part of my video work. Um, you know, I, I make objects, you know, that I use on myself and that are featured in the video. Um, and then I also do, you know, a little, you know, found footage as well, where, you know, I have an injury where I went to the coast um, and integrated that. Um, and I think what, what it is for me is there's sort of like the first phase where you're kind of making and you're shooting the video. And for me, a lot of it, you know, some of it is planned, but a lot of it is also improvised, like once I'm there, you know, um, especially like in my studio, when, you know, I start filming myself, I think, okay, well, maybe it'll be more interesting to try this, or maybe, you know, I'll lay down and I'll try this motion instead. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of gathering of different footage, different imagery, um, to then, you know, kind of combine into more of a cohesive piece. So it's kind of like there's, you know, stage one where you're shooting and you're gathering everything. And then you take it, you know, obviously to the computer and you start combining things. And I think for me, it's at that point where it's like, okay, what, when I put these images together, when I put them in the sequence, you know, what am I saying, you know, what I'm trying to get at? And it's, I kind of allow what I've captured to kind of start a dialogue within itself. And that's what kind of starts to lead to the final project. Um, but it's, you know, and, and like Zach said, you know, in this way, I think of video very much like, you know, the other parts of my practice, you know, with drawing, painting, sculpting, installation and such, where it's not like, okay, I got to all written down bullet point by bullet point i'm just going to hit all those you know points and then go on um it's you know you take some footage and try something new and then you know a bunch of footage you might have had it's like yeah you know i'm here and after effects finally on the computer and it's not that interesting you know so i'm going to kind of put that to the side maybe i'll come back to it maybe i won't um but it's it's you know in that way you know you're kind of like you know growing what that initial idea was and you're kind of like bringing it together to kind of get to that final result. Um, students that walk through the gallery, I mean, like, because it, it is, it's an experience, right? We have eight screens, all with these moving parts. Yeah. Um, and the way that the show is set up is that you can't hear all the sound at once. Um, but there's, but there is sound coming from all eight of these, you know, so there's this like, it's very dynamic and it, so it feels like a very big project when you walk in. And so it's nice to hear you talk about, like, I, you didn't know what it was going to end up being like to have that in your head at the start probably would have been really overwhelming. Right. So you started with like 30 seconds of video and it like, you know, it, it grows from there. And so I think that that's probably really comforting for people who maybe are trying to approach this type of thing for the first yeah. time. Yeah. So we are showing the work in a gallery and you chose how you wanted people to view this work. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and like the difference between um, making a video that's intended for Facebook or like an Instagram consumption, which a lot of people, that's how a lot of people are getting content and art right now versus entering a space where you um, are relating to the video in the physical world? Yeah, I think it's interesting with that, with it being in a space because you know, there's like headphones, you could sit, you can do these different you know, ways that you know, like to take it in. And, you know, whereas I think when you're on the phone, you're just like, okay, I'm just scrolling through and you're not really thinking about that. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it, in general, it's interesting, like when I make decisions of like, okay, this one will have headphones, this one won't, because I, I think I, I'm thinking about the viewer and the audience and like what they're, how they're taking it in. So if it's like, a video that I feel like is more of a personal thing where I want there to just be headphones and are listening to it. Like that's what I want the person to do, whether or not they do it or not, maybe they just walk by and they just want to look at it and don't listen to it. Um, and then in some ways I like uh, to think about like if something's bigger, is there a bench that several people will sit at and if they're watching it and it's not something where they need to hear every single piece of the audio or like they need it to watch every single bit of the, the video where they could be talking about it with someone else and kind of having a conversation, which is something I feel like you don't 
always have when you watch stuff on a phone because you might be like you know looking at it and you're like hey look at this thing you know like and that's really the the experience on the phone if you're trying to share it kind of thing but yeah and i feel like there's kind of this cultural norm now where if you're looking at a phone whether you're in a public space or not it's a private experience and mm. people don't bother you and people just let you walk by and just keep yeah. experience it no matter where you are as a one-on-one -on -one, um, viewing. But when you walk into a room where you, you know, who knows who's gonna enter while you're experiencing this video and people can see what you're looking at and see your response to what you're looking at, it, it changes the dynamic quite a bit. Um, I, I, I wonder if the, either of you can remember the first time you were in a gallery space and experienced a video, a piece of video artwork and like what, because I mean, you're thinking a lot about how the viewer is going to experience the work. And in, as you were talking, it made me think like, how do we learn how the viewer is going to experience it? You yeah. know, because we would have had to have had that experience ourselves at some point. Um, or did we just make assumptions? I mean, it just is kind of an interesting thing. Do you guys remember any works well, that- You know, you I don't remember the first time I saw video work, but I do very clearly remember uh, seeing a permanent installation at the Indianapolis Museum of Art that really kind of made an effect on me in terms of just installation and about the importance of being in the space. I was actually a piece by um, James Terrell who works with, um, you know, just like light and space. And in a way his work is very minimalist, but it's very, very impactful for being in the space. And this is actually, it's kind of silly, but I remember it, I was in, I think it was like a freshman in high school. So I was, me and my friends were still pretty immature. Um, but it was that you came into this large space and there was just, it looked like there was a blue painted square on the back wall, but the blue square just opened up into this huge space. And it was funny because I, I realized pretty quick, like what, what was going on. So I invited one of my friends in, I'm like, oh, come here and touch it. And then I like push them and they kind of oh. like, fell into the space a little bit and so then like everybody did that to everybody else and I, we're lucky we didn't get caught obviously because you're not supposed to be doing that but I it's funny because thinking back on it now that was the first time I really realized like wow art's not just a painting on a wall you know it's it's really about you know the experience of like being somewhere and you know and, and like you know we were talking about too also experiencing it with other people. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think like what's, what's interesting about video art is that especially now it's, it's very malleable. I think like before phones, I think that it was only really like, oh yes, you know, if you want to show video properly, it's gotta be projected and it's gotta be very large. And you know, that's, you know the respectable way of seeing video. But I think, you know, because of phones and because people like kind of digest moving images in such a variety of ways now, I think that really does open up people's, you know, eyes that, oh yeah, you can, you can experience video in really different kinds of ways. And, you know, that's been really important for my practice, um, not only having like, you know, displaying things very large on a screen, um, but even like my um, smaller, um, uh videos you know that go along with the sculptures that i have it's kind of like yes you know you're you have a very different relationship to these small looping jittery videos with these sculptures than you do to this kind of overwhelming you know screen that's about your size where you're experiencing you know somebody you know having these interactions it's almost like your size like one to one yeah. i think about with um how video is in a gallery, how it's presented. You know, I, I think my first experience, I, I don't know my first experience either, but I think about when I first would see like, you see like the white gallery space and then there might be like the screening room and it's just like black box. And it yeah. feels like intimidating to walk in there. Like you're walking into like a church procession or something and you're gonna yeah. hear or something <laughs> like that. And it's like a weird feeling. And so I don't usually like that. It's usually like, you know, I, it's like I want there it to be like in an actual space where people just can talk <laughs> I don't know just you know there is sort of that aspect to it um yeah I, I do feel like 
you know, like thinking about our show, like I, I always think about, you know, when you see a bunch of big screens in a room and it's like, you know, maybe the lights are dimmer because you have to see the, the screens and stuff. It can have that just, there's just that moment where you feel like you're kind of like walking into a church and you, everything's sacred and you can't, you know, touch the technology. There's that kind of feeling you can get going into a gallery sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and with anything time-based, right, you feel like there's a beginning and an end, yeah. and when you walk into a special space, you're like, am I am I coming at the wrong time, like, or the right yeah. time, and I think the way the show is set up, there's, you don't have that feeling, things are looping, the images are yeah. crossing over, and so I think it gives some freedom to the viewer. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit of a kind of a dry topic, but you were talking about using your phones, and so what, I mean, I think it's important to talk about what technology you're using to create your work, you know, because you're right. Um, Aaron and I were talking at the reception. It used to be very expensive to make video work. Yeah. Like you were shooting on film or like, you know, and you had to scan it, like all of these different ways that you would approach video at one point or another in history. But now it's, I mean, it's just like digital photography, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's free to push the shutter. You can get high quality images. If you have the right software, you can make, basically make it anything you want. So how do you guys feel about the, the method of making versus the product that you make? And, and what do you yeah. use to make your product? I, mean, I, I feel like with video, it's changed so much over the years. Like I think when I, when I was in art school, it was mini DV tapes, which <laughs> the bane of my existence I just those are the most annoying things and I feel like I feel like people in college now don't even know what that is so I you know but but you know it's it's a you know it's a lot it would be like a long process too because it's like okay you recorded it and then you got to take like an hour to like get it transferred over and now it's you know it's, you can film it on your phone I mean like I, I could show you like the camera that I used was this little steady cam and that's what I filmed um, two of the pieces where I wanted to have kind of a steady cam feel to it to make it, to break it down so it feels more digital feeling, so it feels more VR feeling. Um, and, you know, if you were to try to get that shot, you know, even like five or 10 years ago, it would be very expensive to, to do that yeah. kind of thing. So I feel like it's really accessible now to like um, create video. So I would say like, you know, if you're, if you don't want to buy a camera, honestly, like if you have a, phone that can yeah. a phone is <laughs> most phones are fine for filming a lot of stuff um yeah. unless you have a specific reason that you need you know some kind of look or something then yeah I understand like it's you might need to get more but even those kinds of cameras aren't as expensive and are still more, more accessible than they were yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's definitely changed a lot you know I <laughs> I mean, you know, one of, the, one of the first things Zach and I worked on, I mean, we took a class together where we did have to do the old school 16 millimeter, you mm -hmm. know, film shooting on it, you know, with Bolex camera and everything. And there is definitely something to be said about the aesthetic mm -hmm. quality of that. Um, but it's also so expensive and such a pain. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, and it excludes a lot of people, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, you know, Nowadays, you know, what I shoot with, I, I do have like a higher end Canon camera, you know, it's full frame and that I can switch the lenses in and out with. But honestly, like the phone I have right now, like the camera in it is probably just as good as what I was using even up to grad school and like camcorders, honestly. Like that's, that's really how accessible like taking footage is at this point, like for video. Um, you know, as, as far as like, and, and people always, they're so surprised because they're like, how did you even make your videos? And I think a lot of people don't realize, you know, I, I mean, literally I use a green screen, you know, it, it, it does, it seems like it's this totally inaccessible Hollywood thing, but honestly, it's like, no, man, you just need like a green sheet behind you or green paint. And then you can just use a program called After Effects and even that used to be really pricey because Adobe products were really, really expensive. But you can get a subscription now where it's like thirty to fifty dollars a month, you know, and you have access to everything, you know, Photoshop, you know, After Effects, you know, Premiere, all the, you know, at the editing suite that a lot of professionals use. Um, so, it, and and even if you didn't use that, there's lots of video editing 
you know, freeware online, you know, a lot of, you know, different things that you can use. So it's, it's really like, you know, if, if you have an idea for video, you know, if you've got a camera and you have time to do a little bit of Googling, you can probably figure out how to get something pretty good looking, you know, which, which is wonderful, you know, because I, I think, I think that's the thing is that it's like video art has been around for a while now, you know, um, but it's really only within maybe the past like decade or so that I think it's finally like accessible to everyone. Mm -hmm. really. Well, um, I mean, we're, we're so thankful to have you in our gallery space right now. And so I really hope that people who are watching this video um, have a chance to come to the Forsberg Art Gallery before February 3rd and see the show in person. Um, but as we're talking about the difference between experiencing the work in a space versus maybe on a screen at home, um, are these videos available um, online for people to watch if they if they don't have the ability to enter the gallery, um, or at least like other yeah. examples of your work that we could send them to? Yeah, um, my work will be online soon. <laughs> so I have to add mine. Not to my There's always thing. a little bit of lag to yeah. like <laughs> the work. And then well, that's good. Time. We have the exclusive <laughs> right now. So yeah. Yeah, you have to come to the um, gallery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, you know, my work, I, I do have a website, AaronRobinsonGrant.com. Um, you know, I have my other work on there as well, you know, painting, drawing, sculptures, installation. Um, you know, so it'll be updated again pretty soon. I'm also a member of a Blackfish Gallery here in Portland. Um, so I've got some of my work on uh, their site as well, blackfish.com. Uh, um, yeah, and you know, if you Google me, you can find stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we'll add some links to the videos. Yeah. You know, so I have my, my work on my website, zacklong.com. And okay. yeah, it's um, both my documentary type stuff that I do and then also some of my personal like uh, film projects. Well, that's great. Um, well, this this video um, we're recording to share with our students. Um, so in closing, like, do you have any like words of wisdom or advice for anybody who um, is starting out as an artist and starting their creative practice? Um, you guys have, are pretty prolific and you have, a, I think, a good community of artists that support you and you've found your way in the world. Um, with really authentic voices for with what interests you. And so I'd love to hear, um, yeah, any any advice you would have given yourself when you were 19 and, and starting on this, <laughs> on this journey. <laughs> I think I would say don't sweat the critiques, the art critiques of your work. Uh, <laughs> that was probably my, I feel like when I was in art school, I was really nervous all the time with my projects and if people didn't fully get it or you know that kind of thing and I think you know if I feel like even like now if I was in that kind of setting they're probably I probably would get torn apart by someone and you know it would be an upset you know whatever it would be you know so I think like just knowing like you're just staying true to what you want to do and whatever you know, useful advice you find like just go from that and if you kind of ignore a lot of any negativity kind of stuff I feel like can happen with with art critiques and stuff like that but yeah I mean and and to go along with that you know I think you really you know what it really comes down to is you know not only finding you know a supportive community and everything but you also just kind of have to have your own trust and your own vision you know where you know you just you know, sometimes you don't have all the pieces yet for what you're making. Um, and, and I think sometimes people get, can be very stifled by that and they can stop or they can think, oh, well, what I'm doing is silly or, you know, it's, you know, unconventional and I don't want to do it. Um, but I think if you just take, you know, the time to really kind of push through those doubts and just really like stay committed to your vision. And that's, and that's the thing. I mean, being an artist is completely democratic. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter what your interests are. It doesn't matter, you know, what perspective you're coming from. You know, being an artist is 
being very much an individual and figuring out how best to express what's, you know, in your heart and your mind. Um, but you just, you know, in order for that to work, you know, you do, you just have to like get past the doubts and you just gotta, you know, make what you, you know, you have to make. <laughs> and if you, if you can get there, then, you know, it'll, it'll work itself out, whatever it is. Okay. So perseverance and don't listen to the haters. Got it. <laughs> I think that's great advice for anybody, Even, no matter what point yeah, say, in your career you're in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time. Um, uh, like I said, uh, Unpacking is a video art show that's currently in the Forsberg Art Gallery at Lower Columbia College's Rose Center for the Arts. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Zach. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.